Hello again, everybody. Welcome to our next installment of our PCB symposia. And on behalf of the planning committee, we want to say welcome. Uh, this is a joint project between the University of Washington and the Puget Sound Institute and EPA's Chesapeake Bay Program Office, the Toxic Contaminants Workgroup. Um, and we've had some really wonderful symposia leading up to today. Uh, and we're going to make a little bit of a shift today um, and really have an opportunity to reflect on a lot that we've learned from PCBs and um, look for intersections with regard to another class of important uh, uh, <clears throat> pollutants, uh, and that is per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS. And we're just going to do a little crosswalking here to see what uh, some similarities, differences, and some things that we can learn from years of managing PCBs. And uh, Mary, I'm not sure if we're gonna talk too much about this today, but we wanted everyone to know that this is uh, a kickoff really for a series that's gonna uh, lead over to SeaTac this year. And we have been approved for a session at SeaTac later this year, and we're gonna continue this theme. Uh, this learning theme, uh, what do we know about PCBs and PFAS? How are they different? And what can we learn uh, with regard to monitoring and future management of PFAS <clears throat> from PCBs? So um, really excited about that theme today. And thank you to Mario and the rest of the team for getting this together. So I'm going to give it back to you, Mario. Thanks, Greg. And just for ease of reference for folks, um, did want to highlight that on our website, you can find the materials from our previous symposiums. This includes some overviews of PCB programs throughout the United States, um, followed by some materials digging into source identification and tracking. And then our most recent one included PCBs and building materials in schools. And I actually see some of our presenters from that on. So it's fun to, to have this growing dynamic community. With that, I am going to hand things over to Joel to get us uh, started. Thank you, Marielle. Uh, my name is Joel Baker. I'm a professor at the University of Washington and director of our Puget Sound Institute. And I'm thrilled to introduce um, two of the real global leaders in the field of environmental chemistry. And I'm pleased to say that they've both been mentors and friends for a very long time. So we're, we're glad that they've, they're able to join us today. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker is Dr. Steve Eisenreich. He's a professor of hydrology and hydraulics and of analytical and environmental geochemistry at the Free University uh, in Brussels, where he joins us uh, in the evening from, from Belgium. Um, Steve spent 20 years at the University of Minnesota, where he led groundbreaking field studies in the occurrence, fate, and transport of PCBs, and is well known for his work adopting mass balance approaches to, to, at the ecosystem scale to understand a lot of what we know about how PCBs behave once they're released in the environment. He moved from Minnesota to Europe where he headed the Inland and Marine Waters Unit of the European uh, Commission's Joint Research Center in Ispra, Italy, where he led the um, European Chemical Bureau and Toxicology and Chemical Substances Unit, leading to the development of REACH. REACH is the European um, framework that um, governs the, the regulation and, and, and management of chemical substances across the European Commission. So he's had a big impact on policy as well as his, the science. With that, I will stop talking, but you didn't come to hear me, you came to hear Steve. So, Professor Eisenreich. Thank you so much for uh, that very kind introduction, Joel. I've known Joel for, well, a long time. I'm very happy to uh, be here with you today. Uh, I've thought a lot about PCBs over the years, and I've been given the task of sort of summarizing what we know and lessons learned. You are all probably experts in one way or another with polychlorinated biphenyls in any case. My, my approach to this is to uh, understand uh, or, or to link the physical chemical properties of PCB congeners to the processes occurring in the environment, particularly the atmosphere and in aquatic systems that determine the fate, transport, exposure, and residence time uh, of PCBs. First of all, I just want to quickly measure that where we are most lucky 
in the environmental organic chemistry field to have such a, a wonderful series of texts. This is the most recent edition uh, of the Schwarzenbach, Geschwind, and Imboden book on environmental chemistry. And it has virtually uh, all the basis for what we know about environmental organic chemical processes uh, today. And I, I encourage you to, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure you can afford it, <laughs> it's quite expensive, um, but to access it uh, electronically in any case. Also, I want to acknowledge a few friends of mine and titans in the PCB field who have passed away in just recent times. Deb Swackhammer passed away in 2021. We were friends for more than 40 years. She was, did an enormous amount of work on uh, bioaccumulation and bio, uh, bioaccumulation of PCBs and those processes. Uh, Ron Heights uh, of fame from sort of the father of environmental mass spectrometry and has done an enormous amount of work on POPs in the Great Lakes atmospheric system. And then my mentor, Don Mackay from the University of Toronto, a modeler, a chemical engineer by training, but really understands uh, as well as anyone in the world ever understood how to model these in aquatic and, and whole river basin systems. So why do we care? Well, it's not surprising, of course, it's because PCBs are bioaccumulative chemicals, they're persistent, they have the ability to accumulate by thousands or tens of thousands or even a million times between water and prey fish and predator fish and then the oceans and marine mammals are also often very laden with, with PCBs all over the world and in some cases to dangerous amounts. And of course they all have PC, the PCB congeners have different, but all have some effects to human health as well, as, as you probably know. So what are PCBs used for? Well, you know this, of course. Um, they are used primarily or were used primarily as coolants and lubricants and transformers and capacitors and electrical heat transfer and hydraulic equipment. They are also legally uh, uh, accepted as unintentional uh, contributions to to various paint pigments, plastics, rubber products, carbonous copy paper, etc. And so you have a hint that there are other sources of PCBs out there today. Broadly speaking, we can separate them into planar and coplanar uh, con congeners. The planar ones, the, the non-planar ones are, are more dioxin-like in their structure and function and are quite toxic whereas the non-planar ones have more neurotoxicity associated with them. They all are PBTs, they all are bioaccumulative and persistent, and so they're very important in the environment. However, over the recent few years, we have begun to understand that there are what we might call non-aerochlor PCBs occurring in the atmosphere, in water, in products, in sediments, started out maybe 10 years ago <clears throat> by the discovery of, of fairly high concentrations of PCB11, a dichlorobiphenyl that is produced incidentally as a byproduct from paint pigments, cabinet sealing and silicon rubber production. We now know that PCB11 is probably uh, one of the most dominant PCB congeners in the environment today. Um, just recently, uh, Frank Vanya's group in uh, Canada has published a paper talking about a wide-scale distribution of PCB congeners 47, 51, and 68 found in the, in the atmosphere in Canada, and it's been also been located in Europe, mostly related to silicon rubber and polyester production, but uh, are occurring at alarming uh, concentrations. Aerochlor PCBs still dominate, in the, in the overall environment, but some of these other compounds we need to start paying attention to. If you want to think about some early papers to look at, you can look up uh, Hornbach, Owania, uh, et cetera. I'm going to have an experiment today. I'm going to give you the key messages of what I think uh, we have learned uh, from PCBs and you can uh, later on, of course, talk about how this relates to PFOS compounds as well. A must read, I must say, is the wonderful paper in ESNT by Kevin Jones in 2021, 
in which he uh, adds a whole section on his personal reflections on how he feels the status of PCBs are occurring today, where they come from, where they're going, where they're going, uh, et cetera. And it's an amazing, complete, uh, and re easily readable uh, reflection. I, I urge you to do that. I think that it is absolutely critical that we understand the physical chemical properties of all the congeners, and we understand how the environmental processes uh, act on them in the environment, in the atmosphere, in water, in organisms. Otherwise, we are not able to understand uh, PCB cycling in the environment or for that matter, any other chemical as well. Luckily, we have made great progress over the years and we now have very good physical chemical properties and understanding of environmental processes acting on them. So we're lucky there. PCBs are, are all, all of them, PBTs. Uh, they are hydrophobic. They have low water solubility, moderate vapor pressures, but sufficient for them to be transported in the environment through the uh, gas phase in the atmosphere. They are widely distributed everywhere. There is no place uh, on Earth or in the oceans uh, that PCBs cannot be detected, whether or not they're a problem. They are removed from aquatic systems very efficiently by natural processes of sorption and partitioning to settling particles and can accumulate and to some lesser extent to degradation. And I'll give some examples of that. We now know that PCBs are emitted in the mid-latitudes into the atmosphere where there's warm or seasonally warm and they are transported and deposited in regions where it is cold or seasonally cold so you are not surprised to find PCB congeners in glaciers of high mountain peaks, in the Antarctic, in the Arctic, in the deep ocean, and everywhere in between. The so sometimes described as the grasshopper effect or global distillation. What I have more understood in recent times is how very, very fast the environment processes organic chemicals. I will show you information today that shows an almost coherence between global PC reduction, emission, transport, deposition, and accumulation in the environment in which the coherence occurs so fast over one or two years. So global transport and distribution processes are much more effective than in fact I had ever thought them to be. The aquatic cycle of PCBs is intimately linked to the carbon cycle. That means that the production and decomposition of organic matter and water bodies is a key part of the, of the processing of uh, PCBs, primarily because uh, they have such a high possibility to partition into living and dead organic matter. And it's the re preservation of that organic matter and sediments that keeps PCBs retained in water bodies. We know from many reports that PCB concentrations are decreasing worldwide at about approximately 10 to 20% per year in the atmosphere and also in many aquatic systems. We now understand that the uh, exchange of PCBs between the atmosphere and gas phase, water dissolved phase and surface water phytoplankton in lakes and oceans is a dominant global process. Sometimes we refer to that as the biological PCB pump. It is most important with respect to contaminating of, of the aquatic food chain and is a dominant process for distribution uh, globally. We also understand now that PCB, atmospheric PCBs are in near equilibrium with marine systems and many inland water bodies, particularly the big ones like North American Great Lakes and, and estuaries. By equilibrium, I mean it appears as though the ratio of the concentrations of the PCB congeners in the atmosphere uh, divided uh, to its concentration in water is very near the, the temperature dependent Henry's law constant, which means small perturbations of temperature, wind speed, et cetera, but near, very near equilibrium. So there's been a lot of volatilization out of water bodies over the last years, such that the air and water are nearly in equilibrium in most places most of the time. 
I think we understand now that present day PCB emissions are still dominated by primary emissions due to use, disposal, and accidents for material that's been banned for, for 50 years. And we are transitioning to a process where accumulation in secondary sources of soils, water, oceans, etc., can be major secondary emissions. But that transition is not completed yet. We know that PCB emissions are largely linked to urban industrial areas. They are source areas, and I'll give you some examples of that. But we are in transition to emissions from secondary repositories, let's say water bodies, uh, soils, glaciers, etc. If we did a sort of global balance of trying to figure out what, is, what are the global reservoirs of PCBs today, of that which have been released to the environment, uh, the literature tends to more or less agree that about 75% are in the shallow and deep ocean sediments, about 6% in ocean reservoirs itself, only 3% in the terrestrial reservoir, which I'm a little surprised, and others which have been related to small amounts of degradation, both in the atmosphere and in the ocean. But we are transitioning from PCB emissions from primary uh, sources uh, to secondary sources. Where and this requires a focus on the processes that generate the remobilization of these PCBs. So we need to know more about the biophysical geochemical processes that are redistributing uh, globally these PCB congeners. And with respect to uh, anthropogenic climate change, there's almost no question that PCBs will be increasingly mobilized from soils and water. Uh, the increasing temperature of the atmosphere and the oceans and lakes and rivers uh, will all result in a different mobilization of PCBs, maybe even more volatilization. We also know that extreme floods uh, transport contaminants uh, from one part of a river basin to another. And we have many examples of that now. It's quite significant. And we now have very strong examples of, of the uh, historical deposition of PCBs and other cont organic contaminants in glaciers, which have started to undergo in, in the 1990s, accelerated uh, melting. And that, of course, melts, accelerates in delivering historically deposited PCBs to, to lakes and oceans uh, downstream of that. And we particularly have to be now concerned about characterizing uh, the, what, what appear to be non-aerochlor or, or non-commercial uh, grade PCB emissions, part of the original aerochlor mixtures, which were stopped producing uh, 50 years ago, because the PCB emissions are apparently high, the concentrations in the atmosphere and water and in sediments are very high and the implications are not yet well understood. And so we must focus on this uh, in the future as well, a new problem uh, for PCBs. There have been uh, an enormous amount of advances in, in tools to collect, detect, uh, and understand and interpret uh, the PCBs in the environment over the years, all the way from glass capillary gas chromatography columns to the ECD detector, to inexpensive mass spectrometers, to improved sample uh, extraction techniques. Very um, happy to have a, a whole host of stable isotope labeled internal and external standards. But maybe the most uh, important advances in recent years have been the development and application of passive sampling techniques for air and believe it or not for water as well. As a couple of examples, I couldn't avoid uh, telling you something about the recent, uh, recently published paper in Environmental Science and Technology on progress in the GAPS network now, which is a global network which has been sampling, using passive samplers, uh, PCBs and, uh, and other organic contaminants for nearly 15, 18 years, I believe, 
you can see the distribution of sites globally. It's a very uh, aggressive project and we're beginning to really understand the global distribution of PCBs as a result. On the right hand graph, you can see that the urban areas uh, worldwide have much higher concentrations in general than all other areas. Uh, and that the polar regions are reasonably contaminated with PCB congeners, much more than background rural and agricultural areas, much due to this uh, global grasshopper distribution process. And so we have a lot of information on that. And of course, we can't avoid talking about the most recent delivery of information on global trends from the African Monet network using passive air samplers uh, in, throughout Africa. Just uh, one graph from that recent paper showing uh, the PCB concentrations over the last uh, decade or so in the cities like Khartoum and Brazzaville versus uh, Mount Kenya, which is a, of course a remote area. And, increase, and interestingly enough, all showing a uh, 10 or 20% decrease in atmospheric concentration, showing the really great value about looking at uh, the spatial and temporal trends by using passive samplers. On the water side, uh, Reinhard Lohmann's group and some colleagues have uh, developed and started to implement a global aqua gaps Monet network using water passive samplers. And you can already see some initial results. The concentrations in water are highest in those areas where PCBs were produced and used, but there will be a lot more coming for this over time. And of course, it wouldn't be long before someone matched uh, passive sampling of air and water together to look at trends in air water exchange of PCBs. Uh, this is recent work from Reiner Lohmann's uh, group uh, on Lake Superior, where he's talking about even though the concentrations in the air and water are very low, measurements indicate uh, still uh, uh, general volatilization of PCBs out of the system, which doesn't occur for, for other chemicals. He's now a, a expanded this to the lower Great Lakes, with really some wonderful work. So this is also an opportunity to look at uh, temporal and spatial trends in, in the dynamics of air water exchange as well, a most important process as we know. I'm not sure we have a problem or not. I, at first I thought we did. If we look at all the PCB papers on using congener specific PCB analysis over the last 30, 40 years, we notice of course that total PCBs are, or some of PCBs are reported based on uh, uh, a lot of uh, very different numbers of PCB congeners analyzed, all the way from seven to up to 90, let's say. Luckily, uh, ISIS has about 10 years ago proposed that in order to intercompare uh, PCB loads, concentrations, fluxes uh, from paper to paper, space to space, that we make sure that we report an indicator list of PCB congeners, this list of the famous seven. And I will note that all of the papers that are doing congener or reporting congener specific results, no matter how many congeners are being examined, they all report these seven. So as long as we ha have these seven in order to do intercomparison of site to site, and, and, and temporal trends, maybe, maybe this is not a serious problem. The other aspect that's very important is to understand the chemical physical properties, the biggest ones being octanol water partition coefficient and vapor pressure, uh, KOA, octanol air partition coefficient, Henry's law constant. Luckily for PCBs, now we have very good measured and modeled and validated uh, values for these, nearly all temperature dependent. KOW, of course, is very important as a tendency of a compound like PCBs to partition to organic matter. Vapor pressure for its transportability in the atmosphere and its inverse relationship to temperature. Henry's law constant uh, across the PCBs is very interesting because it's almost constant. 
which you would expect then a, a constant uh, dynamic of, of congener exchange at the air-water interface. And we'll show some uh, examples uh, about that. So what this tells us, taken all together, that uh, PCB congeners are uh, persistent bioaccumulative toxic chemicals. They are hydrophobic, have moderate vapor pressure suitable for atmospheric transport. They are linked uh, to the carbon cycle, mostly through this partitioning uh, to organic matter, which is reflected in the high KOWs. They're very high volume production chemicals, and we know that they are globally distributed. So they undergo long range atmospheric transport and long range oceanic transport for years. And it is then not so surprising that they are so distributed, even though they've been banned over the last 50 years. A couple of examples from uh, vapor pressure. Uh, th this is a, uh, a compilation of concentrations of PCBs in Chicago and in Eagle Harbor, a site on Lake Superior in the atmosphere uh, since 1996 to 2010, showing, uh, well, the long-term trend, which is a little, which is not very significant in Chicago, the concentrations are not going down, more so a little bit in Eagle Harbor, but in reality showing the seasonal and monthly trends as a result of the temperature effect on the vapor pressure of PCBs being mobilized either out of the land or the water surfaces. And you can see it is a very dynamic uh, process. And it, and it is a very good uh, explanation why we need long-term data sets in order to look at trends because we have these monthly and annual uh, cycles. Maybe even more dynamic is some work from uh, Carrie Hornbuckle's thesis, where she was measuring hourly changes in the concentrations of PCBs in an omotrophic wetland east of Lake Superior. And you can see the PCB concentrations above the peat material in, in the wetland uh, really correlate well to, to corresponding uh, temperature changes, which results ultimately and transport and deposition. KOW, of course, is the other major process. We know that uh, KOW uh, is, a, is a strong predictor of a partitioning of PCBs to uh, organic matter, to aquatic organic matter, as well as soil organic matter. As, and of course, here we have from uh, the Schwarzenbach et al. book, a plot of log KOC, a carbon normalized partition coefficient against KOW for PCB congeners. And we know this works, it's a now in a common understanding. We know that also log KOW is a strong predictor of, of bioaccumulation and bioconcentration factors, showing this plot here of log BCF against log KOW, where over the range of log KOW of maybe three up until seven or eight, we see uh, a log linear uh, uh, response with a very large uh, hydrophobic PCB molecules probably not able to cross the cell membranes, therefore a decrease. But in any case, KOW becomes essential for understanding these processes. And if we put this together in terms of the global distribution Referring to the original model of Wanya and Makai in 1996, now, now talked about by many authors, recently by, by Kevin Jones, where we know that PCBs are emitted in, in the middle latitudes uh, across the Northern Hemisphere, where it is warm or seasonally warm, and it finally deposits in areas where it is cold or seasonally cold. This has been verified uh, not only in, from models, but by looking at uh, distribution of PCBs latitudinally and longitudinally in the Northern Hemisphere. And it clearly shows that PCBs have, have a reasonable amount of mobility to deposit uh, in areas where it's cold far from its emission source and also into the oceans. I found a couple of uh, interesting quotes. One of the quotes that wasn't <laughs> a good science, it was an excellent scientific article Basically, it said that PCBs don't travel far. And I, and I think as far as uh, organic contaminants go, uh, long-range atmospheric transport is not so significant. 
but they travel far enough of hundred or maybe a thousand kilometers in this grasshopping uh, process in order to be distributed globally. The global production of PCBs is, is, a, is a very nice product that started to increase in the 30s, uh, in, increased uh, dramatically after World War II with economic uh, advances, uh, to peak about 1970 or so, and since decreased uh, shortly thereafter, uh, due to both, uh, due to reductions in production as well as banning and restrictions on production. And uh, Kurt Brevik and his crew over the years have also uh, postulated what an emission profile from primary PCB sources would look like. And of course, it looks very much like the global production it, itself, which means PCBs in, in the, through this modeling effort probably doesn't travel too far. 97% of, of global PCB production and use occurred in the Northern Hemisphere. And we expect then to find most of that PCBs which are released in the Northern Hemisphere. We believe that something about one to 3% of global PCB production is, is, has been released and can be found in the global reservoirs, but this is still a, a very uncertain number. It's a very large number, however. With respect to aquatic water bodies, it's very clear that PCBs can be loaded into lakes, let's say, or the coastal ocean uh, from riverine sources and from atmospheric transport. And they will then uh, be incorporated into particles. And depending on the uh, particle dynamics of the system will we'll find their way into the deepest part of the river basin and deposit it and accumulate uh, in cores in bottom sediment cores. And so the, it turns out that the process uh, of, of, of reaching the sediment and being lost to the sediment is quite a fast one uh, relative to the residence time of water in the water body. The, on the atmospheric side, I, uh, we started uh, understanding the role of the atmosphere in the early 1980s. Uh, the International Joint Commission, which governs the, the activities, the political activities between Canada and the United States, contracted with Bill Strawn and myself to try to understand what we know about the role of the atmosphere in delivering toxic chemicals at that time. And one of the statements we made in this report is that atmospheric deposition accounted for a, really a vast majority of the amount of PCB that were in these lakes, at least with the data that we had at that time. This turned out to be a very, very important little report in the fact it was used to insert into the US Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, something called the Bright Waters Program, which established uh, this Great Waters Program is, is to establish research programs to identify and assess the extent of the role of the atmosphere in, in contaminating large water bodies particularly. And it also uh, uh, called for the development and implementation of a atmospheric deposition network, uh, research and monitoring research deposition network that has been operating now continuously since 1991 and has made a tremendous contribution to our understanding of, of spatial and temporal trends because of that uh, continuity. As part of these two research programs, AOLIS and the Lake Michigan Mass Balance Program funded through the Great Waters Program, uh, what we discovered was the very large importance of urban areas in contaminating uh, water system, nearby water system. This is an example from the combined AOLIS Lake Michigan Mass Balance work uh, summarized by Kerry Hornbuckle and her crew, which basically points out that when the wind is from the south coming over the Chicago, in, uh, Gary, Indiana metropolis, uh, industrial areas, et cetera, it delivers quite high quantities of PCBs from the air over Chicago to the air over the lake, which actually changes the entire lake characteristics from being net volatilization to net deposition. 
we know that the PCB concentrations in Chicago atmosphere in the gas phase, even today, are 10 to 100 or even 500 times regional PCB numbers, and they are not going down hardly at all, indicating the quantity of stocks that are there. And when the winds about 30% of the year come from this direction, that the impact is to increase the total loading of PCBs to Lake Michigan by as much as 25%. This is a very, very clear indication that urban industrial centers everywhere are major uh, sources of contaminants like PCBs to neighboring water bodies. With respect to temporal trends in lakes, I bring up one example that we came up with over the years. This is a temporal plot of PCB decrease over the years in Lake Superior. Um, that started out at about <clears throat> 1,000 uh, picograms per liter and are down today to about 50 or 100 picograms per liter. To 1982, uh, this represented something like a 10,000 kilogram loss of PCBs from the water column of Lake Superior. And the question is, where did they go? They either accumulated in the sediments as you normally would expect for a hydrophobic chemical or they're lost due to volatilization. And the other interesting thing is, is that the concentrations today of PCBs over the water in the gas phase in the atmosphere are in near equilibrium with the PCB concentrations in the surface waters, both at about 50 to 100 picograms per liter in the water and 50 to 100 picograms per cubic meter in the air. So where do these PCBs go? One thing that we did was to put in sediment traps, uh, which uh, have the opportunity to collect settling particles containing PCBs, and they may get uh, down to the bottom and we can calculate uh, uh, these, re uh, re uh, whoops, what am I talking about here? The, the ratio of the concentrations or the fluxes to the sediment compared to what is accumulating in the sediment this turns out to be a very important process because that most of the PCBs do not accumulate in the sediments. They are in fact reached the sediments, but then are lost due to decomposition and non-preservation of organic matter. And those PCBs end up in the water column are available for resuspension and for volatilization. If we look across the Great Lakes, it's a very different case. The recycling ratios in Lake Superior are like four to eight, 40 to 80 for total PCBs. But for the other Great Lakes, they're, they're not really very much different than one, which, and that is because uh, organic matter is preserved uh, in those sediments. The last point I make, because I know it's uh, quite uh, late, is that we observed uh, years ago that uh, the concentration profile of PCB congeners of the, in the gas phase in the atmosphere uh, compared to the profile in the dissolved phase in the water column compared to the profile in phytoplankton phase were highly correlated. It doesn't matter if this is from small lakes, large lakes, or even the coastal ocean. That suggested in fact that um, PCBs were probably undergoing air water exchange uh, in which the dissolved phase coming from the atmosphere is taken up quickly by uh, phytoplankton and, and through, a physical, uh, through physical and bi biological processes results in settling particles. And we now understand through modeling and measurements that this results in a dominant uh, global process for how PCBs in the atmosphere are transported into water bodies, including the world's oceans, it has now been used or understood to be a dominant process in the world's oceans as well. So I think uh, I'm, I'm going to just end up with one other uh, phenomena that I would like you to, to leave you with since the time is late. We have now collected data from cores all over, sediment cores all from lakes and coastal waters all over the world. And we note that for many of the sediment cores, the PCB, uh, temporal PCB profiles 
have a signal which looks just like the global production of PCBs, which, which indicates to us that most PCBs reaching sediments, uh, that meet reaching water bodies today are still primary emissions. And that the process of moving from production to emission, to transport, to deposition and accumulation in lake systems occurs very, very fast according to this record, perhaps over uh, one or two years. Uh, a, a tremendously fast response of the environment. And the last thing that I will say is that these profiles indicate that PCBs appear in the, in the onset of these sediment cores all over the world within a, within a year or two of them being first produced and exposed to the environment. And, and, and this is probably true of every other chemical that is produced, whether it's uh, agricultural chemicals or, or products. And, and so there, there is a, a truism, I think, for that we have seen it for PCBs and for many other chlorinated compounds that the, that the year in which they are released into the environment, no matter the amount, they start to appear in nearby aquatic systems and also in distant aquatic systems. So with that, I think I had better uh, stop. Thank you very much, Steve, for that uh, interesting presentation. And again, for those of you listening, um, please enter your questions into the chat. We're going to reserve time for discussion after our next presentation. And we will go ahead and transition over to Professor Scott Mayberry. Scott is a professor of chemistry at the University of Toronto, where he spent his career understanding mechanisms and pathways that determine the environmental fate of chemicals, particularly fluorinated compounds. When I think of fluorinated compounds, I think of Scott Mayberry and his group. Um, he, his group identified the processes by which the highly fluorinated chemicals and commercial products decompose in the environment into the stable bioaccumulative things that we are managing today. Um, Scott currently holds the position of vice provost for academic operations at the University of Toronto. So we're very thankful that Scott was able to carve out a bit of time from his extremely busy schedule running the University of Toronto to be with us today. So with that, I will turn it over to Professor Mayberry. Thanks, Joel. And um, thanks everybody. Glad to be here. Joel uh, doesn't take no, he doesn't take, I'm too busy to <laughs> answer. Um, um, very honored to share the, the stage with Stephen because I've been reading his paper since I was a wet behind the years grad, gradual student. Uh, at UC Davis, and so quite cool, and I use a lot of his stuff in courses I teach. Of course, PCBs are interesting to me because they do degrade. Um, the higher chlorinated versions are more likely to reduction, and the lower chlorinated versions are more likely for oxidation, and that that connection is super interesting, and it's a good uh, learning component for uh, students in environmental chemistry classes. So I was asked to talk about um, Learned things, uh, I want to say that PFAS, short vowel, uh, is one of the conundrums. I've been on many calls, and, and most of the worrisome with lawyers, when they say PFAS, and they're pronouncing PFAS. And I am absolutely certain they think when they say PFAS, it's the same as perfluorooctane sulfonate, and not just any one of the 14,000 at least members of the per and polyfluoroalkyl substances group. So anyway, this talk was put together for a, a fluoros meeting in Idstein, Germany back in the fall. Um, I'm gonna move with alacrity through this thing because it's a little bit too long for this time slot, but really it's focused on what we've learned so far. Um, I'm gonna keep it in this mode so I can look at. There are lots of small organofluorines, uh, frankly, in the atmosphere. Those are uh, uh, part per trillion by volume numbers there. Uh, at the top, there are some natural sources, typically similar kinds of things, small organofluorines. Whether there's uh, that much trifluoroacetic acid in the ocean is, uh, is a debatable point. I'm rather skeptical myself, and it's an interesting um, point of contention in the research literature, which I watch with interest. But um, you'll see in my conclusions, uh, the whole interest in this area of research is Unfortunately, 
predominantly focused on a rather small group of chemicals uh, and policy and regulation and public perception is driven by that small complement, often less than a half a dozen chemicals of, of interest. Um, I like pointing this one out because uh, Angela and, and Corey Young and my group back in 2012 or so, I saw a jug of this compound, perfluorotributylamine, in the NMR facility, uh, five kilograms. Uh, and I asked them, well, what, what is that there for? And they said, oh, we use it in NMR uh, experiments. It's a great heat transfer fluid. And uh, well, why do you have a new jug? Well, we used up all the old jug. And I calculated, you could measure in the atmosphere one five kilogram jug of this compound using NCI uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, we went and looked, found it. Uh, it is currently remains the world record holder for anything ever observed in the atmosphere for radiative forcing, radiative forcing, meaning global warming potential. I think there's other compounds out there. Uh, we've moved on. Of course, I hope everybody recognizes in that PFAS world is a whole whack of pesticides and pharmaceuticals, many of which you know, fluoxetine. Uh, there's a uh, statin uh, drug in there as well that we measure in most human uh, blood samples uh, when we look by, by NMR. I'll talk a little bit about that. But, you know, the fluorine is there for a reason. And frankly, what's interesting is the fluorines here largely replace chlorines, more Stevens kind of uh, member of the periodic table versus my fluorine side. Uh, because frankly, fluorine, trifluoromethyl groups in particular, does a better job than chlorine of inductively deactivating that part of the chemical architecture to metabolic conversion. We'd like a pharmaceutical to stick around long enough to do its job before the body metabolically converts it and excretes it, similar for the agrochemicals. And really, um, that fluorine plays a very critical, critical structural role, um, certainly much better than uh, the nitro groups who used to do that reductive uh, role in the chemical architecture of deactivating and arranging to oxidation. Those have very difficult uh, and problematic toxicological uh, byproducts. The fluorines in this case are, are really rather benign. They do their job uh, uh, really quite effectively. Lots of profile on, on trifluoroacetic acid. I find it uh, almost completely innocuous. It is the byproduct of uh, HFC 134A, the, the uh, refrigerant that replaced CFCs, CFCs who truly did uh, raise the risk of fundamental alterations of life as we know it on, the, uh, on planet Earth with ozone depletion. DuPont brought that um, replacement in, fantastic. TFA is a byproduct. I think it's a benign byproduct myself. But there's quite a bit of that in the environment. The big question in the PFAS world, um, you know, Stephen talked a lot about, you know, industrial production of PCBs. The vast, vast majority of fluorinated chemicals are either in the polymer world or in the surfactant world. I don't show you a polymer, a perfluorinated polymer like Teflon, polytetrafluoroethylene here. I'm showing you a side chain polymer because these on a mass basis are, are much higher. Um, and probably 80% of the total organofluorine production uh, is on the left-hand side of this slide. Surfactants, I show you the food contact paper chemicals because they're, they're gonna appear again later. Similar tail versions. And I love the fact that the biggest difference between fluorine and chlorine is that you know, it says, great, you're hydrophobic chlorine, but I'm also lipophobic. So that fluorinated tail is unique in all of nature for both being hydro and lipophobic, super interesting. And, and re really one of the reasons why organofluorine and its, and its use in the chemical architecture of, of uh, designing chemicals to function delivers some unique properties. Anyway, the AFFF foams, the firefighting foams have, you know, a different head group, uh, but ultimately uh, they look roughly the same as these surfactants. And then the question is, do these contribute to contamination? In early days, industry, at least some in industry would say, we have no residuals in our industrial materials, which 
I thought that was pretty silly. I've never known anybody in organic chemistry to have 100% synthetic uh, outcomes um, with no starting materials left over and, and full 100% conversion. Of course, neither did they. But a fundamental question of these polymers and surfactants for that matter is what's released from it. And you see there in 2004, 10 to the six kilograms per year, 80% polymers, 40% of that um, uh, in North America. But the fundamental question, are these simply residual materials that will later, I'll show you data measure in the environment, or are these in-use polymers and surfactants degrading? Industry for a long time said, we have no residuals, we have no degradation. Silly on both parts. Uh, Joyce, uh, who's on this call, PhD in my group uh, back in the early aughts, uh, and have an updated slide in review. This has got a lot of citations. Uh, took a bunch of materials and measured dry weight uh, percent residuals in these commercial uh, and consumer products, you know, of a few percentage points. She found the most fluorinated chemical I think ever appearing in the literature of, at 49 fluorines uh, there at the bottom, tentatively identified from that one of the phosphate mixtures. But clearly, uh, residuals make up uh, a significant portion of potentially what's released into the atmosphere. We look in the atmosphere and lo and behold, we find them. Uh, it took a little while to figure out the methodology on this, but ultimately it's pretty straightforward. You see there hundreds of picograms per meter cubed for both the fluoro telomer alcohols and the LAF. That's the telomer folks, DuPonts, uh, Asahi, Clarion, um, Atofina, a bunch, and then sulfonamides, which is primarily the purview almost entirely of the 3M Corporation. They use different kinds of fundamental chemistry, but still delivered perfluorinated alkyl tails that are hydrophobic and lipophobic. Um, it took six years, because uh, industry did not like this data. It took six years for somebody to replicate and publish a paper on FTOs and sulfonamides in the atmosphere. Um, it wasn't because it was hard. I just think maybe it wasn't of interest. That's, uh, you know, in hindsight, a bit odd. So of course, what else could happen? Well, could the FTOs degrade or the sulfonamides degrade into perfluorinated acids, PFCAs here, perfluoro carboxylic acids? Um, yes, indeed. And in fact, one of the things we noticed, I show you there C9 acid and C8 acid, and I'll show you structures later, roughly equivalent concentrations. Not always, the February uh, 3rd one here is not the same, much more BFOA than C9. But often if you look across here, pretty similar concentrations and then declining concentrations of the shorter chain versions. But we also saw some of these intermediates, which was important. Um, if it's raining P perfluorinated carboxylic acids and PFOS, well then when you look in the world's soil, you will find those acids. Um, they are mobile, uh, but not tremendously so. And so we'll measure them all over the globe, even in Antarctica, one sample. Uh, but you see the concentrations uh, here in picogram per gram of the carboxylic acids, the sulfonic acids. And this was Keegan Rankin, a student who went down and worked with John Washington and uh, EPA uh, when he was a graduate student. So that's important. More interesting, people are freaking about biosolids. I'm a farmer. I'll be planting soybeans this weekend on biosolid amended soil. I love it. I love the cycle of taking... Uh, outputs from humans and recycling them back through the uh, agricultural system. Um, Maine had some problems with their biosolids because there was an industrial source. Um, for us uh, in Canada, bioamended soils show no different than non-biosolid amended soils because, of course, the background uh, of what we can measure in those soils follows the background of what we see pretty much all over the globe. Um, of course, uh, this is Cora Young, faculty member at, um, at um, Young, um, York University here in Toronto. She wanted to go to the Arctic. Um, we sent her with 1950s gear because we were worried about contamination. And she reported, you know, when you're sitting on the Devon ice cap at minus whatever, um, this old stuff doesn't work very well. And she froze. But what we measured was PFA fluxes to the Arctic. You'll see in the bottom right, this was some work. We did some model prediction with Tim Wallington 
uh, at Ford. We did a whole bunch of work with him. And you can see the model predictions versus the measured were you know, really quite consistent. I'll talk more about what that model, the basis of that was. Uh, Amelia da Silva, and by the way, the reason there are pictures in here and citations for some of these slides is these slides were put together for a talk to honor Derek Muir. He's still alive, so don't take anything from that. Um, and uh, these were students uh, who he co-supervised uh, uh, in part of his, when he was adjunct here at U of T. What Namila said is, wow, very interesting. The fingerprint of Papoa in Char Lake and Amatuck Lake uh, in the Arctic is 99% linear, very little isomer. Because of course, different manufacturers have different fingerprints. 3M, their fingerprint of their materials uh, is very isomer laden. And uh, PFOA is only about 80% uh, in the factory when they make it. Um, as you can see here, it's very different. Now, of course, there is some discrimination, but certainly our think at the time and remains that, well, maybe the source is a linear source. The telomer source uh, is entirely linear. So this is suggestive. Um, uh, Naomi Stock, another grad student who also worked with Der Derek Muir, who's at Trent University now, uh, went back to the Arctic, paddled around. I think uh, Cora's in that boat as well with Derek uh, and took uh, both water uh, and sediment uh, samples. And what's interesting here is that you see all the things you think, the acids and PFOS, the real C8 carbon sulfonate acid, but you also see these things. I'll talk about them again, but they're reaction intermediates from fluorotelomer alcohols and um, perfluorinated acids. Um, John Martin, who did um, his PhD on a, on a research project that I uh, had funded, uh, he was his major supervisor, Keith and, and Derek, uh, and then he came and did a postdoc with me. He was the guy we worked out because we'd proposed, we need to, before we knew there was anything other than BFOA, we had no idea if there were longer chain acids. Uh, we wanted to know the structure activity aspects of this. So we wanted to do bioaccumulation, bioconcentration with, with the full homolog series, taking a, a, a page out of the PCB literature. But we had everything in our from TFA all the way up, sometimes the C15 acids. Um, and we had them in our uh, analyte mixture. Uh, and we did some studies on them. And John showed this. You can see the citations, tremendous. This was These were two very seminal papers that had a huge influence, uh, certainly on industrial practice. Uh, the whole industry shifted shortly after this to much shorter chains um, because you need seven carbons with fluorine to be bioaccumulative. You need seven carbons with fluorine to be bioaccumulative from an aqueous solution, fish swimming in that aqueous solution. The whole industry shifted to the left of this line, 3M to four carbon, DuPont, et cetera, to four and six eftos. They tried to abandon the longer chain versions of this. And of course this was done because um, we did a laboratory experiment. What was fascinating is John, uh, we had some uh, polar bear livers. You can imagine how hard those are to get that Derek provided. And John came into my office one day crushed and said, I have contaminated somehow all of these polar bear livers and we had seal livers and they were all contaminated with nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 um, chain link perfluorinated carboxylic acids. And, you know, we started talking about his QAQC and it was solid and it was clean. And then the light bulb eventually went off. It didn't take very much time. Uh, no, indeed, these longer chain acids were there. They were at relatively high concentrations, made PFOA look boring here in the bottom right version. Uh, we even ran a um, Utoff experiment on this just to make sure because it was such a, a big um, um, outcome uh, and very important to the overall story. Um, so the first thing to do, of course, this is what to do. The first thing was remove residuals. Uh, and we certainly noticed industry doing a better job of removing residuals. And then, as I said, everybody shifted to four or six carbon um, 
uh, industrial consumer products. Uh, it was interesting to me that this came after, um, back in the early 2000s, I visited DuPont a number of times. Um, they would say routinely, you need eight carbons to work. And that eight carbons with fluorine gives you the absolute best. If you had a surface that's fluorinated, a water droplet has the best, most extreme contact angle. Uh, it's the most hydro and lipophobic with eight carbons. But as Bruce said in a CNN article, wow, some of these things actually work well enough for the consumer that are shorter. So that's why they did that. So you'll never hear me use the F word, that word that most of you have heard about, you know, it has uh, something like forever in it. I just, I just really can't countenance because it's so silly, so unscientific, and it's so wrong. Many carbon fluorine bonds do degrade, uh, and it doesn't observe that moniker. It is the case that it requires special cases or conditions. Uh, in this example here, Prozac, uh, we published a paper under photo, uh, uh, the attack basically uh, photons, uh, ultraviolet photons, that will photohydrolyze the CF3 group to a carboxylic acid and produce three equivalents of F minus. Um, and it goes through an acid fluoride. We know that and we confirm that using F19 and MR because this has a unique signal. There are photonucleophilic displacement reactions as well. Uh, bromide is the best leaving group. Chloride is reasonable. Fluoride is, fluoride is a terrible leaving group, but it will go from the activated state, not from the ground state, but from the activated state. This even happens in in-use chemicals. Really nice paper from David Ellis, who has since passed away. Um, most of the carbon fluorine bond here in this uh, lampricide ends up as fluoride. There's a small amount of trifluoroacetic acid as a side product. Um, fluoride is a terrible leaving group, as I said. You know, you know, HF is not very good acid. Uh, F minus is not very stable as F minus. So you really have to force it by the product of that hydrolysis being something even more stable. And the carboxylic acid is more stable. Um, here, carbonyl fluorides are very common in the atmosphere in the translation. I'll show you this, where the bulk of the fluoride in, fluorine ends up as F minus. Mother Nature is quite spectacular in ability to transform things. So if you have the right architects, you can eliminate. I'm going to, if you put trifluoromethyl phenol para into water, um, it will lose a fluoride within a few seconds. We cannot actually measure the compound on the left in water. It loses that fluoride so fast. Resultant um, double bonded uh, difluoral compound is relatively stable. I think I want to show you this reaction here first. Um, and biotic is much faster than abiotic. But losing HF a 1-4 loss, these are sort of Michael addition kinds of cases where you have a high, an acidic hydrogen next to a, a leaving group, in this case fluoride. You can lose HF across this bond. It's an E1CB elimination for those who care about that. To get this acrylic aldehyde or acrylic acid, you produce HF. But you also produce, in my mind, the mo one of the most toxic at least acute toxic chemicals I could draw with a four, one, four position electrophile that's really quite ex exquisite. I'll say more about this later. Mostly though, you hear about PFOS or PFOA, carboxylic acids, sulfonic acids. We also discovered uh, phosphonic acids in the environment, not a lot published on that. It's a little more difficult analytically, I find it fascinating. We think it should still be paid attention to. And then you have the dialkyl phosphinate. All these are perfluorinated acids. Are they all extremely persistent? Unfortunately for Stephen, PCBs deserve the moniker of persistent until they met PFOS. PFOS does not degrade under any known human scale timelines. And so, if this is persistent, I wouldn't suggest PCBs or DDT are because of course they do degrade on years to decades timescales. Well, this one does not. But it's fascinating to us when we dosed fish with this compound and we dosed rats with that compound. I'm gonna jump up ahead of time, oops. 
um, we found, uh, well, we found these phosphinates in um, uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, NIST standard, standard reference materials, about two nanograms per gram. But when we dosed rats or fish, we saw this reaction really quite fast. Both in rats and fish can hydrolyze that phosphinate bond, the PCF2 bond, to form the phosphonate on the left-hand side and a, a hydroperfluorinated alkyl as the leaving group. Because uh, fund fundamentally, it's a hydrolysis reaction, probably oxidatively driven. But this is fascinating. I don't see much reference to it in the literature, but this perfluorinated acid is most certainly not persistent. It is really quite labile. Um, just to repeat something I said earlier, CFCs were horrible, uh, brought real question of life, continued life on earth as we know it. Uh, ozone depletion was a real problem replaced by a different chemical architecture that had an Achilles heel, really to the reaction sign point. We count on mother nature having a hydroxyl radical to extract that and, and replace it. These are the further replacements with double bonds, they'll go even faster. Atmospheric fate, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. We know from the EFTOs and there's about 50 or so papers from this group, students and, and, and Tim Wallington I group, that 90% of the attack is on the uh, alpha hydrogen. We form telomer aldehydes, but ultimately all of these products, including the carbonyl fluoride that degrades completely. We know that from the eight two, you get roughly equivalent amounts of the eight and nine. Remember that rainwater data I showed you and decreasing concentrations of each acid afterwards. Here's the mechanism. We know a lot about it. Very low amounts of perfluorinated acid produced. The major is this compound, which means it mineralizes. And the overall reaction here uh, has been worked out to quite satisfaction. And we also know, at least our hypothesis and our theory is that the sufficient lifetime of these get it to the Arctic, acids are uh, released through rain, et cetera, into the Arctic ecosystem, and then work their way up uh, the food chain uh, to reduce those concentrations we saw in the polar bears. Cora Plus published a review paper, effectively all organofluorines who make it in the atmosphere will produce acids. Uh, through Mother Nature's uh, mechanisms, albeit at usually a few percentage uh, yields. Evolution of chemicals. Uh, these are some of the things that industries come up with. Merck came up with this next generation replacement. These are basically produced more of the same kinds of problems. This Merck compound, a uh, lot of research here, but ultimately this compound completely degrades under environmental conditions all the way down to min mineralized starting points, which should be the objective to produce a chemical that will work where we want it to, but when it's ultimately released in the environment that it fully degrades. So I view this as green chemistry. Trends, the reality is the general population, oops, I thought I'd changed my slides, but I clearly didn't. Um, this, um, from 1999, uh, here's PFOA, here's PFOS, milligrams per liter, yeah, parts per million in human blood. They've been decreasing pretty solid all the way down to 15, 16, both PFOS and PFOA. PFOA, a little bit less reduction than PFOS, probably because of, uh, of use patterns more generally. Um, no data set, one more year of data since then, which I had. Um, but due to COVID, et cetera, the CDC is still working on their recent data. But the point is, huge amounts of project process, progress, one of those P words, since 3M pulled their chemistry uh, in 2001, shifted to shorter chains, and the uh, telomer manufacturers did the same. Great outcome. Are humans exposed to lower amounts of PFAS? Yes, they are, but the amount that we don't know what it is, unexplained organofluorine is probably going up. A uh, number of results from that. Um, and, and you see here a paper from Leo Jung, who used to, did a postdoc in my lab, says, you know, in the current, more recent data, uh, fairly significant amounts of unidentified organofluorine in human blood. PFOS concentrations in lake sediment, Ontario core are declining. 
Uh, it took a while, but they are. Um, human exposure. Um, we find quite a bit in humans and have for a while, as I showed. There's always been the question of why and why are polar bears and humans the, the two most contaminated organisms in the world? Uh, two main ideas, direct and indirect. But one of the things I wanted to um, comment on is really the, the toxicology. We did a bunch of work with Keith Solomon and Paul Sibley at, at Guelph back in the early aughts on the toxicity using farm ponds. I'm sort of riffing off this silly keen shoe ad, although I have keen shoes on today. But really, it was extremely difficult to find a uh, observed effect concentration. Uh, 30 to 70 for PFOA milligrams per liter in these farm ponds. That is a rather uh, higher number than uh, the EPA health advisory in drinking water, uh, almost three quarters of a million. Similar for PFOS, maybe slightly more aquatic toxicity. But my point is, um, do these things contribute to what's in human blood? And if they do, it's a much more meaningful conversation. I'm going to focus over here because most people on here have had microwave popcorn bags. Um, you know, our hypothesis is that you were exposed indirectly through of these, through metabolic and converting them to PFCAs, uh, PAPs, um, the mono pap here, these food contact paper, we published a bunch of papers. Jessica Dion from my group is now a faculty member here at U of T. Um, uh, Joyce, who's on this call, did the first biodegradation of the EFTOs. Uh, you do produce uh, these unsaturated aldehydes that we know react with glutathione. Uh, the acids also react with glutathione. The question is, do proteins? Um, but before I get to that, I told you we find these intermediates uh, in the environment. And compared to the perfluorinated acids, which are not very acutely toxic, um, to Daphnia magna, these things are 10,000 times more toxic. And the reason is probably that the FTCA is a travel agent to deliver HF inside the cell because we lose HF across this bond in that E1CB elimination reaction I talked about to make the acrylic acid a, a pretty good uh, electrophile in and of itself with its own toxicological implications. But we're hypothesis of the HF. But this 10,000 time number uh, is super interesting to me. And as of back in the spring, it only had 100 citations. I'm surprised at that. So what we know is that PAPs, that food contact paper chemical, are in human blood at reasonable concentrations, micrograms per liter. Um, sorry, I said milligrams earlier. It's micrograms per liter concentrations. In the, in the border of the PFCAs themselves, within a factor of 10, but the dye PAPs only last hours, uh, at most a day or two, while PFOA is multi-years uh, uh, in, the, in the body. You can see here on a rat experiment, we expose to the PAPs, they degrade uh, to PFOA, but also all the things in between. So here's PFOA. We know that these, all these intermediates are here. We know they bind with glutathione because we've measured those. The first observation of this reaction was 1981 with Hagen and Belil, and then um, more since then. But the reality here is this Michael edition I was talking about, that one four location really has good uh, potential to, uh, as electrophile to react with endogenous nucleophiles. And in fact, when we expose apomyoglobin, uh, we measure adducts uh, in this particular uh, protein. We measure uh, increasing toxicities to cells uh, with these intermediates. We uh, can form adducts, measurable adducts by mass spectrometry. This is work by Amy Rand, who's a faculty member at Carleton now, did all this work for a PhD. Uh, this is with here, human serum albumin. Um, I'm gonna switch to polymers. Industry says polymers do not degrade. That's silly, um, they do. I'll show you the data. We can watch it, uh, hydrolysis study. They're esters for goodness sakes. Of course, an ester is going to degrade. 
Uh, even in soil extracts, we can monitor the polymer using Maldi-Toff mass spectrometry. Um, we can measure in the Maldi-Toff increases uh, in the deg degradation of the polymer itself, um, as in here. Um, so they do degrade, and it represents, a little like Stephen was talking about, a very large reservoir of material that could ultimately uh, release perfluorinated acids. Final section, fluorine NMR. Most people do mass spectrometry. We like NMR because it tells us lots about um, uh, really what's there that you don't know what to look for. I'm going to show you just one final slide. Normally, you do slides, uh, sorry, scans for hours, um, and you get thousands of scans. Well, we figured out how to do millions of scans. And so this is a polar bear liver. And this is what that polar bear liver looks like under 3.9 million fluorine NMR scans. And frankly, we've done about 10 times better since this slide was built uh, and made it much more productive. But we see alkyl CF3s, we see aromatic CF3s in that polar bear liver. I don't imagine the um, polar bear livers are on Pro Prozac, but one never knows. We will see. Um, summary thoughts. We've learned a lot. Chain link matters. Please, please take one thing away from here. Not all PFAS are persistent. Um, they simply are not. And in fact, most of the chemicals released in the environment from industrial and consumer uses are the volatile uh, building blocks of those materials. And they degrade really quite reasonably in the atmosphere, but not to 100%. There are... Uh, some amounts of perfluorinated carboxylic acids, usually one to five or so percent. Um, the original chains are declining in humans, really quite dramatic. I I'm, I'm find somewhat uh, humorous the interest now compared to 20 years ago uh, when actually we've been making progress. Uh, shorter chains are more widely used. That's a good thing. Just a quick thing, it's interesting, relatively paltry activity in the scientific community of polymers, which is the vast majority of the materials produced, very little on reactive intermediates and relatively little on the atmospheric side. Uh, I still comment when I re review, analyte list often is quite traditional and unimpressive with respect to asking the question, what else might be there? And then of course, we've had some progress towards greener use of that. Huge number, I tried to mention them all, talented students who produce this work. Uh, in Canada, most work is funded by INSERC. You write a five page, this is for Stephen you, and, and uh, Joel. You write a five page grant. It lasts for five years and you don't write a report. I love INSERC. So thank you everybody. And thank you, Scott. Um, yes, we are envious of your funding program. <laughs> Thanks for sharing all, the, all, all that work. Our, our intent now is to open it up to both Stephen and, and Scott and maybe go back and forth with a couple of framing questions and, and then we'll open it up to the broader audience for, for, for questions. But Steve, I'm wondering, you know, as you're, as you're listening to, to Scott's presentation, um, what do you see as kind of the key similarities between PCBs and PFAS? I mean, there's clearly some differences, but, you know, from your, from your perspective, what does what translates from the PCB world into the PFAS world? And then Scott, I'm going to ask you the same question backwards. So let's start well, with the commonalities. The, uh, the uh, of course, the environmental processes that are affecting, uh, that are acting on PFAS are the same, but the physical chemical properties are, are, are of course, very different. And of course, the numbers of contributors <laughs> are very large. And so, um, I'm not sure. Uh, the interesting, one of the interesting things that Scott said is he, he sort of uh, discards PCBs because they degrade. They are capable of being degraded aerobically, anaerobically, hydroxylated, react with hydroxyl radical in the atmosphere, except uh, that those are relatively minor processes uh, affecting the, the global distribution of PCBs. Uh, in sediments as well, um, the concentrations are low enough, the temperature is low enough, and the microbial activity is low enough. It's all anaerobic, of course. And, and so um, there's not a lot of, of uh, 
of uh, let, let's say the importance of of of, of degradation is, is not great compared to the accumulation uh, of, of the chemical itself. Yes, the processes exist, but but the chemical still still is there. The other thing, Scott, I was wondering, um, you, you're not very uh, happy with the oceanic measurements of the perfluorinated species. And I, I've read a few, you know, several papers that seem to be quite rigorous in at least developing uh, some picture of, uh, of these fluorinated compounds in the oceans. Why, why do you think you don't believe them? So just to, to start with the last one, not the general measurements, the question about how much TFA is there, not the longer chain. Ah, okay. Those are not, there's not an issue. It's just, there is a very robust and it's quite um, engaging debate about TFA itself, the only about TFA. And on, um, the reality though is in the fullness of time, the PCBs are expected to degrade. Uh, because if the set, and, and by the way, I never said it, but the ultimate fate of most of these, the perfluorinated acids will be the ocean. There will be less in the sediment relative to the overlaying water just because the partitioning behavior is not uh, anywhere near the same as PCBs. But, you know, at some point in the future, you could imagine the vast majority of the carbon chlorine bonds to have broken uh, under, probably if they're in sediment, under reductive reactions. PFOS and the carboxylates, TFA, nobody has ever observed an actual environmentally relevant reaction that showed a transformation. So we're, we're left with, um, this is where <laughs> I usually, I never use the word forever. I use the word redefine persistence as we understand. It. The other aspects, I think what mother nature can do with respect to processing and um, reactions uh, is really quite in, in similar for both classes of, of, of chemistries insofar as they're susceptible to certain reactions in certain spheres, the reagents that, are, that prevail in those spheres. The similarity is oxidation in the atmosphere is uh, possible with both and, and certainly dominant with the, uh, the what I call the volatile uh, uh, fluorinated compounds. Um, however, uh, at least for the perfluorinated acids, um, reduction is not a possibility with with PFOS. Uh, I mean, we've we've done extreme uh, efforts at looking at putting an electron on to get a fluoride to leave, and it just doesn't happen. It's funny. I have a, a PhD student from China who did a duel with me, who had that chlorinated <clears throat> PFOS. We see the chlorine pop off right away. And you're and it's not surprising. In fact, it goes faster than PCBs because of course that carbon has two fluorines on it and a CF2 tail mm -hmm. uh, upstream. So the ability to put an electron on that carbon is enhanced because the reduction potential is so high. And chloride is a decent leaving group. It's, it's, it's only those special cases where F minus is a decent leaving group. And you really have to open it up but my fundamental comment is that we've replaced PCBs with alternatives um, and we can replace these kinds of chemical structures that are causing long-term uh, environmental contamination problems with the fluorine if given uh, sufficient room to be creative uh, and strategic in our approach. Uh, the European Union, if, I don't know if you get to regulation, Joel, but the European Union wants to ban all of them. And that's something I find deeply problematic. Okay, thank you. Maybe a different question, shifting gears a little bit. Um, both of you are known for your work detecting these chemicals in remote environments. And kind of, you know, back in the day, that was quite an alarming finding and created a lot of controversy and also inspired a lot of research. Like, well, yeah, why did polar bears get these chemicals? Why does the middle of Lake Superior have these chemicals in them? Can you speak a little bit to how that affected your kind of progression of your research programs in your career, just the, 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 the observation of these things being globally distributed? I guess that's for me first. Huh? So, um, well, it, it was instrumental. I, we, we sort of walked, let's say, did a stepwise process as we, as let's say, as we started working on Lake Superior, we're trying to understand the dimension of the issue. 
and we began to appreciate the importance of, of, of the atmosphere, uh, not only then with respect to Lake Superior, but with respect to atmospheric transport and deposition everywhere for all of these types of organic compounds. So it very much directed uh, the future work. The, um, the water column work was really a follow-up with that because we considered Lake Superior to be atmospherically driven. But a curious thing happened. Um, we were measuring annual concentrations of PCBs in the water column. And then one year, uh, the concentrations went up by a factor of three. And 300 percent, it's just impossible to recognize. Of course, you go back, you reanalyze all of the data and the sampling techniques and the protocols, and you realize that the numbers are real. And then we discovered that in that particular winter, it was a very long winter, <laughs> unlike today, in Lake Superior, the ice didn't go out until June, and the lake never stratified. And so there was bottom sediment resuspension throughout the water column the whole year. And then, of course, the next year went back to sort of the long-term trend and continually to decrease. But we started then looking at particle dynamics, particularly organic carbon, particulate organic carbon dynamics, as a mode for controlling the fate of PCBs in systems. And so that triggered our, our work in that direction. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Scott, thoughts on how the Arctic program affected your research or how your research affected the Arctic program? <clears throat> Well, we had, we, had some, we did have some hints. Uh, we knew from Gizzi's work. Uh, first, I first heard about it through 3M directly because they came out when I was a grad student at Davis and said, can you run some NMR in these things? Like, yeah, that's great. But it got a hint at what, what Gizzi and, and his folks were finding. Right? Basically, every sample, no matter where in the world they uh, found it, they could find PFAS and PFOA. And John once told me at a CTEC meeting, but he really missed because of course all those thousands of samples all, also had all the long chain acids in them. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, and he, you know, you don't know to look for it in mass spectrometry, you're not going to find it. So um, it was that, and it, I went to some link to tell the story that we actually thought we contaminated the, the, the um, sample. The finding the long chain acids in the polar bear livers uh, was a dramatic impact because we had this hypothesis that telomer alcohols would degrade uh, in the environment. That was another thing industry pushed back hard on despite the Hagen and Belial paper from 1981. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the early 80s, I sorry, the early aughts, 2000, 2001, two, um, these were very controversial ideas that there'd be alcohols in the atmosphere, that they would degrade into acids, that they would then get into the food chain. Uh, and, and of course, the longer chains are much more bioaccumulative, of course. Uh, each CF2 is worth 7x in partitioning potential across the lipid gill membrane. Um, that was resounding because we suddenly realized what we're seeing is because the longer chains are more bioaccumulative and reaching higher concentrations in those polar bear livers, that then um, they couldn't have gotten there by swimming. Uh, there wasn't, there just, there wasn't enough, nobody was measuring C14 acid in the ocean at the time. The concentrations were extremely low. But in the atmosphere, we can measure their precursors. And of course, the modeling exercises, all the laboratory uh, results we did at, uh, at Ford with Tim, et cetera, it all made, made sense. It sort of fit together. And it's not the only story. There are other ways. But you know, when we look in humans, you find very clean PFOA. You don't find a whole lot of uh, electrochemical flow, flow meaning the, the branches. Uh, that's sort of Amila's work. Um, and, you know, in that rainwater, you find the eight and nine as equal uh, concentrations. And then really the 10 and 11, the 12 and the 13, the 14 and 15 are usually similar concentrations. Anyway, I think that told us it was a more global story and gave us a hint as to how that how that movement transport could happen. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask one more question for the both of you, and then we'll open it up to, to more broader questions. Um, so we have on this call, and this, this workshop series has been targeted to 
Um, a lot of folks who work for regulatory agencies or, or management agencies and are kind of charged with cleaning up sites or managing those chemicals at a, a sort of state local level. Um, you've been around a long time. You've been doing this work a long time. What, what, what two or three words of advice do you have for people whose, whose job it is now to manage? And we'll, maybe we'll start with the fluorinated compounds. So you're at the state level and you're, you're, you've been charged with managing, a, you know, the, the fluorinated compounds in your state. What, Scott, what would you tell them? Well, don't assume, don't paint the whole class with one brush. Um, that's the first comment. Um, uh, really, the chemical architecture is what matters. And across 14,000 uh, chemicals, uh, versions of organofluorine, the architecture varies really quite dramatically. And assuming we can manage, we can regulate based on one uh, assumption, uh, frankly, based on an infinitesimally small number uh, of those 14,000, uh, seems to me not only scientifically unsound, uh, but practically unsound. Um, but I also would encourage, uh, we don't know everything there is now. As I, as, I, as I showed you, even what's in human blood, um, a significant amount we don't know the identity of. Now, we think our fluorine NMR technique, we hope to, to say something intelligent about this in the very near future. Um, but that's that's important. And frankly, what I would say is, uh, you know, there's a reason why I showed you that aquatic uh, toxicity data, because these things mm -hmm. are not, the perfluorinated acids, the things that EPA is regulating now, are not toxic in an aquatic ecosystem to Daphne Magna or anything else that's sensitive. But I also showed you that intermediate uh, toxicity data that was 10,000 times more. Nobody's regulating those. When I look at the scientific literature and the toxicology literature, nobody's doing research on it. So I mm -hmm. would appeal. I would appeal. Because uh, I got my PhD in a toxicology department. I took lots of those courses. But I'm not a real toxicologist. The It is really surprising to me the amount of, and it's regulatory driven, uh, regulators ask for more and more work on PFOS, the sulfonate acid, the carboxylic acids, and you know that's where the funding is. But I don't think that's where the risk is. I think the risk is us being exposed. And by the way, where those biosolids have food contact paper chemicals in them at high concentrations. These are biosolid samples applied two weekends ago. Um, that means those biosolids come from one place only. Those come from humans. That means we're still exposed to very significant concentrations of chemicals that will metabolize in your blood and you will produce chemicals that, at least from a structure perspective, look as toxic as anything anybody's ever published on. If you all recognize the only chemical in cigarette smoke ever truly proven to cause cancer is acrolein. Acrolein is an unsaturated aldehyde. The chemical I showed you is an unsaturated aldehyde made more reactive by having a fluorine and a CF2 on the reactive carbon, on the electrophile mm -hmm. itself. So my sense is we need to be more broad-minded, less focused on the things that are easy to measure. The fact of the matter is PFOS and, and PFOA are turning up all the time because they're the easiest chemical pollutant ever to measure. Uh, they're the perfect structure to sit on the surface of an electrospray droplet. They're 100% ionized, PFOS anyway, 100% ionized, and that and they're very volatile because of that uh, heavily fluorinated thing. So they, they give exquisite sensitivity, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure it <clears throat> matters. Thanks, Scott. Steve, you want to take a take a shot at that? Maybe with also um, with your experience. I, I with wonder if reach. I can. I, I wonder if I can uh, ask Scott a question first. Absolutely. In the, <laughs> in the EU, they are revising the major water, the water framework directive, the drinking water directive, and the groundwater directive. And because of this, of major concern about perfluorinated contamination of all of the media in Europe, they, uh, they are proposing uh, a monitoring, mandatory monitoring scheme for 20 PFOS, PFOA compounds. Mandatory monitoring 
in drinking water and groundwater and surface water all over Europe. And there's thousands of sampling sites. I was, first of all, I was wondering if you were aware that they were proposing these 20 perfluorinated compounds for mandatory monitoring. And secondly, are they the right ones? Probably not. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know which 20, Stephen. I, I certainly was there in Germany. And, and I mean, I'm intentionally being a little provocative here today because, you know, that's what academics are supposed to do. But I was trying to be provocative there. And, and the big question of the day is, should all PFAS be banned? Uh, I mean, I just find it just so deeply problematic on many levels. Um, I guess my comment, it's worthy of monitoring. It's worthy of monitoring for the right things. I have no idea what those 20 are. I, I probably suspect that they're the things easiest to measure that have had the most profile now, but it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You mm -hmm. find what you look for with LCMSMS. You publish what you find, and then the next people look for the thing, and it just propagates over time. I think we need to look for things that aren't typically being looked for, things that do react, things that will uh, undergo metabolic conversion because that's where reactive intermediates are formed. Uh, there's somebody in the in the chat, Andrew, to you know HF. Um, you know the the reality is HF is not something you ever want inside your cell. But I've shown you a mechanism where I am certain that you everybody on this call have these food contact paper chemicals in your blood. You are metabolizing those things. You are producing HF inside your cells. Period. So to me, those are the things, they're harder to measure, of course, but this is 2024. We should only be doing hard stuff, not the easy stuff. <laughs> Steve, do you want to say a little bit more about the, the you, you introduced the idea. On the PCB of, side. <laughs> of the, yeah, of, and particularly the, maybe the non aerocore PCBs and the, what you're thinking and, and advice on that topic. The most recent uh, papers are, are, well, quite alarming to me in that uh, these these congeners appear to be have have been around for a long time. They are not dominant at all in the in the aerochlor mixtures. They are legally uh, permitted to be um, uh, to occur as unintentional uh, contaminants. Let's say in the production process, particularly of silicon rubber and, and some certain processes like that. And the the load of them in the environment is probably much greater than than we think. And to many cases, the recent papers indicate that these non aerochlor so-called non aerochlor PCBs are at high higher concentration in the atmosphere and in the water column than normal PCBs. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 that particular thing. The other, uh, yeah, I think it, we need to focus more on this for sure. The, the original question is related to management of PCBs. I, I think uh, from my uh, participation in the previous uh, uh, video conferences symposia, that the, the managers have a good handle on managing uh, primary sources of PCBs that are resulting in the in the fish contamination in, in the estuaries and the embayments, et cetera. And they have developed good strategies for uh, trying to determine where, where that is coming from and, and shutting that down. It will take time and resources for sure. But I'm really now concerned about these new, uh, well, probably oral, old <laughs> sources that we just never recognized were around, but, but uh, apparently are very, very high concentration. We do not know whether they have uh, major toxic effects yet, but need some attention. Great, thank you. In the interest of opening up the conversation to others, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Will Hobbs. Will, Will is um, with the state of Washington Department of Ecology, and he heads up there, all things PCBs for us here in the, in the Pacific Northwest. So Will, I'll turn it to you and you can lead a discussion of questions. Great, thanks, thanks Joel, and thanks very much for both of our speakers for spending the time with us today. Uh, we really appreciate um, yeah, we really appreciate you attending. Um, 
So we're going to open it up to the general audience. So uh, reminder, you can raise your hand and we'll unmute mute you to ask questions or you can put questions in the chat. Um, there was a question that popped up early on in the in the talk in Steve's one in Steve's talk that had to do with pathways of PCBs. And the question was around the sort of primary emissions and whether you could maybe talk a little bit about you know, what that means now in terms of PCB loading. Um, and I suppose that question is also relevant to, to Scott too, when we think about uh, emissions of uh, PFAS in the, in the environment. So Steve, I'll... Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. The, uh, by looking at the uh, relationship of North American and global production of PCBs and to their signals in the environment, they really look like uh, primary sources. We do know that primary sources are still contributing in urban industrial centers to major water column and, and atmospheric concentrations. And the, the uh, size of the stockpile is only slightly estimated, but we do know that the stocks from the old days are still very, very uh, prominent. Um, we also have a better understanding of the uh, of the fact that most of the PCBs that are cycling in the environment now are really also from primary sources, and that the secondary sources the secondary sources are like uh, soils and water that has been contaminated historically, and now those PCBs get mobilized in one form or another. We are probably going to transition to this, but it's also true of PCBs don't really move that far from the source. It is a little surprising. I didn't get a chance to say it, but the uh, the temporal signal of PCBs accumulating in lake sediments all over the world, from what we can tell, uh, is the same as the atmospheric signal, the same temporal signal for the atmosphere, which says that that PCBs are sort of exposed to the atmosphere and water in a similar time frame and that they're emitted throughout the river basin and beyond in the same time frame, that they are incorporated in bottom sediments and in surface soils uh, in the same time frame. And so the, the, we have the same temporal signal, which is kind of uh, surprising. The, the, the inventory that is involved, of course, is much different. The lakes accumulate much more than than those systems that are soil systems that are dominated by the atmosphere, but the temporal signals are the same. And this occurs uh, all over the world. Yeah, thanks. Scott, did you have any thoughts on sort of primary emissions really for uh, PFAS in the environment? Well, I think um, a lot of it comes from industrial and consumer uses. Uh, you know, the the vast majority of the groundwater contamination uh, that you hear about in the legal cases is coming from use of AFFF um, foams, not in fighting fires, but in practicing to start fires. So yeah, I'm you know that's just a tragedy that could have been avoided. Uh, cities who hire fire departments, supervise fire departments, somehow I don't I question the fiduciary response the the professional. Uh, the responsibility of those cities and those fire departments who could have been using non-fluorinated foams to practice with, because the vast majority of those AFFFs were used not to fight fires, but to practice. And oftentimes they were left to infiltrate uh, soil and well, I guess out of sight, out of mind, contaminated groundwater, uh, and you have this massive problem. So uh, the, and here's a problem. Steve showed great data. Um, you know, Stephen, you had a bunch of examples around continued atmospheric concentrations. Frank Vanya has been doing it. I said in 2001, we published the first paper on these telomer alcohols and sulfonamide ethanols in the atmosphere. It took six years for anybody else to do it. I went to update all that data thinking they would all have been dropped by now. There's, there's almost no data in the atmosphere. There's a bit of passive sampling data, but frankly, underwhelming. Uh, given how much profile PFAS has now and fluorinated chemicals in general, regulatory action, you would think uh, the scientific and regulatory communities would have driven uh, from a monitoring perspective 
much more atmospheric uh, work. Um, I can tell you what's interesting back in the early days, we had a air sampling station outside Griffin, Georgia. Griffin, Georgia is the, ca the carpet capital of the world. And the signals from there were unbelievably high because of course, the, the soil, the, the Scotch guard and the, and the uh, DuPont version of that for uh, stain repellency on fabrics and carpets was, was sprayed on an aqueous solution and then sent, went through a dryer with, with uh, like going through the car washer, hit it with hot, dry air. And of course, to blow off and dry off that, that coating, and you got a huge signal of eftos uh, and sulfamidoethanols in the atmosphere in Griffin, Georgia. Um, none of that work is being done. So we, I don't know how much um, remains in commerce, if you will, in that regard. I also don't know relatively, I've not seen decent papers on, you know, unlike the rather mature aspect of PCB research, in use materials, how fast do they release uh, these chemicals? There's, there's relatively little research in that as well. Great, thanks for that perspective. Um, so you, you touched on the sort of impacts to, to groundwater um, and and in, in my sort of world that's that's loosely regulatory in the work that I do, that really seems to be a, a predominant focus for um, human health impacts and for cleanup efforts. I'm wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about the importance of that sort of contaminant pool versus some of the more diffuse uh, contaminant pools that we see in the environment for, for PFAS. Well, I Perhaps think, just in terms of yeah. what, you know, a regulatory agency, how a regulatory agency should be, be maybe be approaching these. Yeah. Well, what I find interesting about that, looking at it from a distance and, and um, uh, my colleague, Chris, Chris uh, at, or at Colorado State. What's Chris's last name? Help me, somebody. I can't hey. jump on there. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. right. They can't jump. Anyway, uh, we he and I were talking about it. You know, there's PFAS and PFOA in groundwater and a few other things. Very little PFAS, yes, but very little of the PFOA was ever used in AFFF firefighting. Very little as a as a impurity. And yet the chemicals that were used in firefighting aren't, as far <laughs> as I know, ever observed in groundwater. Or for that matter, um, uh, have we worked out actually in those kinds of environments, how you go from an AFFF foam surfactant into the products that are actually seen in groundwater? Are we looking in groundwater for all the things we should be looking for? Um, and, and the obvious question there is how big is the, the, the overburden reservoir uh, that could conceivably for a very long time period be slowly releasing the ultimate degradation products. That's something I didn't talk a lot about, but I view PFOS and PFOA as mostly degradation products. And that's why my comments around, we should be looking for lots of other things, looking at other things, because if they're degradation products, you ask the question, degradation product of what? To your quest, to your point, there's only about five papers on fluorinated polymers. Two, who, two from my group, I think one or two from DuPont and one or two from... Thank you, Joyce. Chris Higgins is at Colorado State. He and I were talking about this. But the polymer world, there's I think there's six papers. Industry said they never degrade. The only thing you see is the residuals. I think that's not right. But, you know, we published a paper. We'll wait to see if somebody uh, replicates that data. But that's 80 percent of of the, the burden of organofluorines in the environment were from polymers. There's six papers on it. There may be a few more now. I did look a while ago. So that's an interesting component. I do think there's organofluorines in the atmosphere that, that are there that we just haven't measured. Uh, that was the whole point of that little one-off exercise. Go find something crazy in the atmosphere with 28 fluorines per fluorotribulamine. Pretty sure that there's other uh, amines in the atmosphere uh, and probably other compounds. But again, regulators aren't very interested in that. The scientific community uh, isn't. So it becomes more a question about 
what drives area of, of inquiry? Because in Canada, I never have to get money to study what I want. I always study what I want and then go get more money. Um, it's it, it's been a, a you know very freeing in that regard. But I feel for my colleagues elsewhere who you know have much higher bills uh, to keep grad students uh, uh, in the lab and postdocs, et cetera, and, and much higher overheads and those kinds of things that are, are more dependent on some source of funding to do exploratory type research. It's just not ideal. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that perspective. Um, Steve, maybe I'll ask a quick question about inadvertent production and some of the uh, some of those congeners. I'm wondering if you could just sort of provide some context for maybe the European regulatory world and how those are being viewed and whether, you know, for instance, you measured that or you mentioned that they're not, those compounds aren't part of the IC's sort of seven compounds for summing PCB totals. So is there a discussion going on at the regulatory level for those inadvertent PCBs and are they a major issue? I'm not sure Steve is still on. I thought he was thought he was still on with us, but uh, perhaps not. Sorry, can you hear me now? No, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, great. Okay, yeah, uh, not from the policy perspective. I don't hear uh, really anybody in the agencies uh, or the ministries talking about this non aerocore business. It is coming out in some of the research papers, particularly in Germany where they've been doing uh, passive air monitoring around major industrial facilities, uh, particularly rubber manufacturing, silicone rubber manufacturing and things like that, where mm. they are seeing a lot. PCB11, the dichlorinated congener, which, which has turned out to be a, a quite a strong contaminant in, in paint pigments and, and the Apparently the industry understood quite well that this was a contaminant they could get rid of and they changed the process. And uh, that PCB11 is no longer in the yellow and blue paint pigments that, uh, it, that it was probably the main source from before. But in Europe, uh, they are not yet talking about that. They're completely dominated by the perfluorinated story at the present time. Right, yeah. Um... So we did have a question pop up in the chat relative to um, um, Scott's talk. Whether you could you could comment on how you view the development of the newer PFAS compounds in relation to the precautionary principle, and what are your thoughts for how those should or should not be regulated as they are developed and used? Well, I can tell you if, uh, so Mark was in, in Germany, they did produce, and we, Andrew um, uh, Fulkerson, and my student PhD, who's on this call, finished his PhD in four years during COVID, quite an accomplishment, um, showed that they're very benign uh, and uh, really quite um, successfully uh, a green alternative. They have ceased working on it because they're in Europe and Europe is signaling that it will remove all creativity and all uh, driving behind producing uh, better alternatives by simply banning the whole mind. That's why I think it's just, it's just public insanity. Um, so with you, you do what EPA requires. If you have a new agrochemical, you do all the studies or a new pharmaceutical for that matter, money for that matter, the FDA requires. Well, we do all the similar kinds of studies. We show that, and we're smart enough, it's 2024. Um, show what happens to it if it's released in the environment. We can give very good uh, predictions and, and uh, uh, projections, if you will, about uh, lifetime in the environment, what it degrades to, uh, are there any toxicological implications of products, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, life could be much, much better. Imagine where we would have been in you know, after Montreal Protocol, when CFCs were banned and DuPont was not allowed to bring forward 134A. The human misery that would have come from that globally and, you know, not having air conditioning, not having um, uh, 
refrigeration, uh, misery and death, if you will. I, I'm not trying to be histrionic, but that would have been a fact. That would have been crazy. Uh, we would have had a much worse outcome. So my view is um, do the, you know, follow the regulatory requirements to show that your chemical, the whole green chemistry movement is around trying to develop, it's all about chemical architecture. And I use that phrase specifically because it's putting atoms together in such a way that they function where you want them to, but that now that we know how the environment works, thanks to Schwarzenbach's book, uh, came out when I was still a grad student and it became my Bible. Um, you know, we know so much now, we can, we can avoid uh, chemical pollution problems. Uh, we're smart enough to do that, but it is not helped uh, by blanket um, bans. Imagine after PCBs, if government said, no more chlorinated chemicals, period. I just, it's inconceivable. That's my comment on that. And unfortunately, folks, I'm a vice president during the day, and I have <laughs> 200 guests, 200 tents, or like 400 guests, on my green in front of my building, uh, and it requires my attention. Uh, unfortunately, you know, VP operations, I do all things, and so I do need to vacate. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me, and kudos to Joel, because he really was persistent. <laughs> Scott, thank you so very much. We're going to wrap up with the rest. I know you have to run and that we really do appreciate you carving out the time. Very interesting talk and always good to see you. And, and good luck to you with your challenges. So for the rest of you, thank you, Stephen, um, also for your presentation and for the discussion and for everyone mm -hmm. joining us to, today. Um, definitely learned a lot and to be continued. I'm going to um, thank all of you for participating and then pitch it back to Mario, who will wrap up with next steps for us. Mario. Yeah, just a reminder that we will have slides and the recording available on our website. And certainly, I think this is a case where there's a lot of additional detail in the slide. So if there was a piece where you're like, oh, that was interesting, we didn't get into as much detail, encourage you to check those out for more information and also for the, the resources and references there that can allow you to go deeper. Um, as Greg mentioned earlier, we do also have the session at SeaTac that will continue in this theme. Um, abstracts are due shortly on May 15th, um, so drop the link in there, but really appreciate the thoughtfulness and conversation here today to not only talk about what we know, but also to reflect more broadly on um, how that evolution informs where we go from here. So. Thank you again to our presenters and Stephen, especially for the, the late evening with the time difference. So 